physics, Heinz R. Pagel physics talks. Um, as many of you may know, these usually happen, you know, in a wonderfully festive environment in person in Aspen when we're all there and relax and enjoying the mountains. But now we are doing this on Zoom because that's what we do in the modern age. Um, so my name is Michael Brenner. I'm a physicist and applied mathematician at Harvard. And um, I'm here because I was one of the organizers of a workshop that we were going to be um, running in Aspen this summer, which was called Data-Driven Discovery in Biology. And the idea of the workshop was to use the, was, it was built around the fact that, you know, sort of data sources in biology have been growing and growing and that ideally one would like to take that data and turn it into understanding in some sort of a way. And this, of course, is something that physics as a subject has historically been quite adept at doing. And the, and the, the thought was to bring together a sort of diverse um, interdisciplinary group of both physicists and biologists and other types of scientists to use the wonderful environment in Aspen to try to make some progress and conceptually and otherwise. And um, so we're all very sad. For those of you who are joining us from Aspen, we're all very sad um, not to be there. It's really a wonderfully stimulating place to think and do physics and to talk about science. And we're all looking forward to being back there next year. So um, let's see. So we're very lucky today um, to have Rama Ranganathan from the University of Chicago, who's going to tell us about his work. Rama actually is a biologist. Um, he um, is a professor of biology, um, but um, he also, and I think you will see this in his talk, has really been one of the pioneers in learning how to think quantitatively about the mapping between genotype and phenotype, especially as it um, relates to proteins, which I believe will be the subject um, of his talk. Um, I've known Rama for a long time, and he's a, a very deep thinker, and I, I think you will see this in his talk. He's particularly skilled at asking and finding the right questions in a way that's really unusual, and I was always very struck by this about Rama. Like, there are people who just know how to ask the right question, and one day he actually told me something, which Rama, I hope you don't mind if I tell you, tell everybody, I'll, you know, I'll just make you slightly nervous, is that, um, is that, you know, when Rama was a graduate student at UCSD, one of his, you know, closest mentors was Francis Crick, who took him under his wing and, um, you know, um, talked to him about science and what science was and what it meant to ask a question. And I think when you listen to Rama, you will see the influence, um, you know, of the master, as it were, in, in what he rubbed off on the young Rama. Rama also told me that none of his thesis advisors knew that um, he knew Francis Crick and were shocked when at his thesis defense, um, in walked Crick. Um, anyway, we're really happy, Rama, to have you here and um, we look forward to your talk. And oh, by the way, I'm supposed to say, so um, questions we're gonna hold until the end. Um, if you have a question, you can um, e um, raise your hand and I will call on you at the end. You also could ask it in the chat and I will like go through it and make sure everyone gets to ask questions. But we're gonna, the, the decorum here is to let it, Rama go through his talk and then we can ask lots of questions. Go for it, Rama. All right, great. Well, uh, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, it's a pleasure to give this talk in this slightly odd way from my home in uh, Chicago. I um, want to say that the Aspen Institute has been a favorite of mine. I, I, I've done, uh, I really enjoyed coming to the Institute and I'm sad that I weren't able to come this, uh, this summer, but it's wonderful that, there, that these lectures are going on and it's a, it's a pleasure for me to do it. I uh, also want to thank um, Michael for his overly generous uh, introduction uh, in here today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about this uh, line of work really that I've been doing for over two decades now, which I call the design of evolved machines. And so let me begin by basically telling you the uh, nature of the problem, the questions that we're asking, and then I'll tell you about the findings, which I think are, 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 inter are, are interesting and tell us things about what to do next. So, you know, the subject is biology. Uh, let's see if my mouse works here. Can you guys, hopefully you can see my mouse on my pointer here. Um, so uh, the question, the, 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 the question of the biology. So, you know, biology, uh, the study of living things operates on a wide variety of scales from the scale of nanometers, uh, you know, molecules, proteins, which are collections of atoms, all the way up to the scale of ecosystems, which can be of size meters or even kilometers uh, for all we know. And you know, across all these scales, biology builds information and material processing systems that have remarkable characteristics. They're very high performance, they're adaptive, and it's been a, a goal for, in biology for, uh, really uh, for a long time to understand how all this works. And not only how do these systems work, but how do they get built? 
through a, a process which is remarkably simple and algorithmic, the process of evolution. But these are the motivating questions. And I'm gonna tell you this, uh, uh, what we we're doing in this area uh, from the perspective of protein molecules way over on the left side of this diagram, because actually at that scale is where we have the most experimental and conceptual power at the moment. But I'm gonna come back to the problem across all these scales later on after I tell you a bit about proteins, uh, because ultimately we'd like an approach to answer these questions, not just the molecular level, but across all the scales. So what about proteins and you know, what, are, what are proteins? So proteins are the, you know, they're the nanoscale machines that occur in all cells that is set to carry out basically all the chemical reactions necessary for life. And this means you know, binding proteins like antibodies that bind other things, uh, catalysts like enzymes that carry out uh, even difficult chemical reactions, and then things called signaling molecules that send information uh, from one place to another. And these characteristics emerge uh, because of the way that proteins are shaped and how they look and how they, uh, and, and, and how they move. So just to give you a little background about proteins, just to, so they, you know, you're looking at these cartoon diagrams here. What are these things? So, you know, proteins are, are polymers made up of the, these basic building blocks called amino acids. And there's 20 different kinds of amino acids and the genes in our genome uh, code for the information to make these polymers. Um, and so proteins start these, their lives as these you know, linear polymers, long chemicals, essentially strings of amino acids. But the remarkable property they have is that under the physiological conditions, like in a cell, they're able to spontaneously fold up into these uh, you know, three-dimensional architectures. The car a cartoon diagram of one of these protein architectures is shown here. And you know, we show the proteins like in, the, in this form, in this sort of cartoon representation, uh, mainly because it's hard to describe them otherwise, and we need a language to be able to communicate with each other about proteins. And, and proteins are made up of basic architectures like these alpha helices and beta strands. But this is sort of a cartoon representation of the three-dimensional structure of a protein, and it's that structure that has its functional properties. But I want to say that you know, we, we do like showing proteins as these cartoon diagrams, but I want to point out that proteins don't look like that. I mean, they're really uh, collections of atoms, right? Uh, so uh, what you see on the left here, the, the blue molecule is essentially an all atom representation of that same protein in the previous slide, uh, making the point that it's really a dense cluster of atoms that have come together in space to enable the function, in this case of this protein, to bind a substrate uh, uh, molecule uh, at a groove on the surface that we call the binding pocket. And you know, just to show you how uh, you know, compact and well-made the protein is, is, if I cut the protein down the middle and I open it up like a book so you can see on the inside, you can see that the proteins are really dense networks of atoms that are packed up in a, in a nearly precise and locally exact way. People refer to these as three-dimensional jigsaw puzzles because they look like that. All the amino acids um, uh, packed up against each other in, in a seemingly nearly perfect crystalline sort of way. But I wanna also make the point that though proteins look like these sort of perfect crystalline architectures, in fact, they are also uh, are dynamic entities. Uh, proteins uh, carry out motions. And in fact, the function of the proteins depends on the way that the proteins undergo cycles of conformational changes. So for example, on the left here, I'm showing you the product of really decades of work by investigators showing the action uh, uh, in, in the uh, reaction cycle of a particular metabolic enzyme. And the main point to make about the picture is that the protein undergoes a set of discrete conformational changes going round and round the cycle. And going around the cycle at different places, substrates bind, products get released, cofactors bind, the chemistry happens, and so on and so forth. So proteins really move round and round in these conformational cycles to carry out their actions. And that going round and round in a kind of a, 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 a conformational change pattern is why we call proteins molecular machines. They look like machines doing an orderly uh, a, a set of changes that underlie their, under, their chemistry and their function. So I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, in some sense, proteins uh, are like that. 
you know, now that is a machine in our conventional world, right? And when we make a machine and we try to make it really a good machine, a high performance machine, what we understand about engineering is to make a good machine, you should rigidify it in all the ways that it's not supposed to move, only let it have degrees of freedom, that is motions along directions that define its essential function. And in that way, the machine becomes good or optimal at converting whatever fuel you put into it into work done, which is what we're trying to do with the machine. So that's a machine in our conventional world. The, uh, the, the, the thing is, this is what a protein machine looks like. Okay, and uh, I don't know about all of you, but that doesn't look like any machine that any human would make. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, in contrast to a human made machine, it has very high degrees of freedom, very large numbers of uh, things that are moving around. It's jiggling and wiggling all over the place. And, you know, it makes the point that proteins are really soft materials that operate near the edge of noise. Uh, they're, they're really uh, 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 dynamic entities that have uh, the kind of motions in which we don't really understand what it means that it's doing a machine-like characteristic. And I want to say that that shouldn't come as a surprise. These are not man-made objects like the thing on the right. These are evolved systems that have a design for adaptive high performance that we just don't have any good models for. And we need to understand that if we're ever going to understand how protein molecules work to do whatever they do. So, um, you know, uh, this is not a new problem by any means whatsoever. I mean, uh, this problem dates back to the dawn of really modern biology, uh, uh, molecular biology and structural biology. Here, for example, is a paper published in the, you know, before I was born, uh, which is the, uh, uh, reports the structure of, a, uh, of one of the first proteins solved, which is uh, a molecule called hemoglobin. Many of you will be familiar with the idea. Hemoglobin is the molecule in our bloodstream that carries oxygen. And it was known for decades before even this study was done that, that hemoglobin came as, a, uh, as a, a molecule that has four binding sites for oxygen. And in fact, uh, each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules. And the interesting property, a critical property for the physiology of how oxygen delivery happens to our tissues is something called cooperativity of oxygen binding. It means that when one oxygen molecule binds at one site on the hemoglobin, somehow it changes the action of, the, uh, of a di distantly positioned oxygen binding site so that it facilitates binding over there. So somehow binding of oxygen here is felt by something far away over here where uh, the second oxygen binds. And that cooperativity property is critical for the biology of how hemoglobin works. So when here's a picture on the top right of Max Spritz and John Kendrew, the people that did the first structures of proteins, and that's uh, them holding their molecules at the Nobel ceremony where they got the prize for doing the structures of the first proteins. And in fact, you know, the question was, uh, when hemoglobin structure was done in the late 50s was, well, how does it work? You know, how does the oxygen binding at one site control oxygen binding over there? And, you know, this problem actually was, um, uh, it's a famous problem and it's been talked about by many people, but one of the people that talked about it that I really like this uh, way of describing it was, is actually Richard Feynman, the great physicist who, as you know, in the early 60s gave a series of lectures at Caltech that became those books that many of us learned physics from called the Feynman Lectures in Physics. He gave one lecture on that date, October 3rd, 61, that was called Relation of Physics to the Other Sciences. And in this lecture, you know, Feynman talks about many things uh, about how physics is related to other aspects of, of science. But he actually talks about biology and talks about hemoglobin. And actually there's uh, some recordings of some of these uh, lectures. And so what I'm gonna do now is actually play for you an audio clip of what Feynman said about the protein problem back in 1961. Okay, so let's, let's hopefully this will play through my speakers and you will all get to hear it. So here's Feynman in 61. One of the great triumphs of recent times within the last year, in fact, was the last to discover the exact arrangement in space and the order of the all the amines from 56 to 60 amino acids in a row, over a thousand atoms, well, nearly 2,000 hydrogen atoms, have been all located in a complex pattern for one, and now two, the first was hemoglobin. One of the sad 
response to this is, and as far as we can tell, yet we can't see anything through this pattern. We don't understand why it works the way it does. Okay, anyway, uh, the, the point uh, uh, I'm making is that Feynman, you know, uh, he actually gets many things wrong. I mean, hemoglobin doesn't have that many amino acids and so on, but he really gets the essence of the problem that finally we have the uh, to great precision, the position of all the atoms in the structure, but we don't understand how it, it works because of that pattern. And he declares that's the next problem, and that was 1961. I would say it's still the problem of structural biology to explain the function of proteins given their structure. And the, you know, we've never been able to really uh, understand this or rationally control proteins. Uh, and it's not, again, it's not because people haven't tried very hard, but our knowledge of the physical and evolutionary forces that play in the origin and the function of proteins is just simply too incomplete at this point. We still don't, don't get it. But if only we could, I'll just say that the implications of this understanding are enormous. Um, the design of many things, you know, therapeutics and industrial catalysts, uh, molecules that could harvest energy and carry out environmental remediation. These are all problems that are sitting there waiting to be solved if only we could uh, build these molecules and understand how they work. So the question is, you know, how can we really learn this? How can we learn the, how the nature is building these things and what the rules are? So, you know, one way to do it might be to just do experiments. Uh, you know, we do a thing in biology called mutation experiments where we go around the protein and change uh, every amino acid to another amino acid and see what the effect is of carrying out that kind of a mutation. It's a way of kind of probing what's important in a protein by saying, if I mutate that site, do I get an effect? Well, the, you can do this and people do it a lot, but just consider the numbers. You know, if you want to really do a comprehensive analysis by mutation of even one protein, you know, a typical size of a protein, you may have to do a thousand experiments, mutation experiments, but that's just doing single mutations at sites. These, uh, the point of a protein is these amino acids talk to each other and the interactions are really important. So then you have to look at maybe the double mutants in a protein to probe the pairwise interactions. Now that becomes like a million experiments. And I'm a, you know, a little bit grossed out to say that in fact, we can we do that kind of scale of experiments these days. We can even make a million uh, 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 you know, mutations in a protein. But then what about the three-way interactions and the higher order? I mean, the bottom line here is that we're never gonna be able to comprehensively explore the the, the, the interactions of all the amino acids by doing these sort of uh, ex mutation experiments, even though we've learned a lot by doing that. So the question is, how can we really uh, get the design rules and how can we attest that we have it once we have a model for it? Well, it turns out there is an interesting approach and that really is inspired by Darwin. So this is a, uh, you know, the statement of Darwin about biology, the principle of evolution is incredibly simple and, and, and beautiful in its simplicity. He says, all the properties of living things, including proteins, uh, in this case, would be, he says, our consequences of one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. That's the principle of evolution. And, you know, when we think about what this process would mean for the way a protein has to be made, you realize that, you know, in Actually, you could say that evolution has been doing the experiment that we want to do for us already uh, for like billions of years. So evolution has been doing what? Varying uh, uh, molecules and selecting them for function for a very long time. And now after all uh, uh, the evolution has, has happened up till now, we're left with all the genomes of all the organisms that live today that have survived this process of evolution. And the question you can ask is, Maybe to understand the design of this protein, you shouldn't do experiments on one protein. You should go and get yourself a, a database of all the genome sequences of all the organisms that people are sequencing, and those databases are growing really exponentially. And looking at that data of all the, 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 the sequences that represent that protein and its function, maybe you could learn something by statistically modeling all the interactions of all the amino acids. And that's the idea of what I will call a statistical genomics approach to probing how protein molecules are built. What's the uh, consequence of this kind of an approach? What kind of data do you get? 
you get things like this, this matrix you see on the right. And just let me explain what it is so it, it makes some intuitive sense. What that matrix is, it's showing you by a calculation on genome sequences, how every position in this protein going from beginning to end, from the start to the finish, is talking in evolution that is co-evolving with every position going from beginning to end of the protein. So this is a, uh, a, a matrix of co-evolution. It's, it's, it's seeing through the lens of evolution how all the amino acids in that protein are talking to each other. And so, you know, it's not a physical measurement, but it's a representation seen through the lens of evolution, a model, if you want, for the pattern of amino acid interactions. And that's exceedingly interesting because the question is, what does it tell us about how proteins work? And then, uh, you know, does it uh, give us the, the rules that we want to know about how proteins are built? So one thing that we can do is to analyze this kind of uh, matrix of coevolution, this, uh, uh, this matrix of amino acid interactions seen through the lens of evolution. And it turns out when, I'm not going to explain all the, the underlying mathematics here, but it turns out that when you uh, analyze what information this matrix has about that protein, it all boils down to the idea that what is encoded in it are a networks, small sets of uh, uh, positions, sparse. Sparse means that the number of amino acids engaged in this system are actually small compared to the size of the total protein, but there are little networks of, uh, of amino acids that connect the main functional side of the protein uh, marked by this yellow uh, substrate here, uh, uh, through the inside of the protein sticking out the backside. Okay, so these, these networks of, uh, of, of amino acids is apparently what nature is uh, imposing in the design of the protein. And we gave this thing a name, we call it a, a sector, a protein sector. We, gave, we had to give it a name because there was no other language to speak of this kind of architecture before this sort of analysis was done. But basically what it comes down to is these networks inside of the protein uh, are these are what we, we would say are primordial units in the evolutionary design. And it's, there are hypotheses for the essential interactions that hold together the protein and give it its function. And just to show you its architecture, here I'm showing it to you, uh, you know, on this cartoon representation. But if I showed it to you on the three-dimensional structure showing all the atoms, you really see what I mean. This blue network is like a wire running from the functional side of the protein to the backside through the interior where most of the atoms in the protein are staying out of it, okay? So these are like internal wires or connecting distant sites. And actually, you can find these kind of networks in many, many proteins. And I won't tell you the story about all these guys, but I'll just go back to the, the problem that I set up a little while ago. Remember Feynman and the hemoglobin problem? Well, it turns out in hemoglobin, you actually find the uh, network of amino acids that run from one oxygen binding site to the other oxygen binding site. And actually a huge number of experiments over four decades uh, tells us that this actually is a recapitulation of the model, physical model for how cooperativity in oxygen uh, really emerges. So uh, it turns out this evolutionary approach using sequences is telling us something deep about the physical basis for how proteins basically work. Um, and, and there's been a lot of further investigations like that in other proteins. But what I wanna ask here is something even more general than that. Like here, here what we've done is taken a protein, use this idea of uh, uh, that evolution has done experiments for us and mining the data of genome sequences to pull out this matrix uh, hypothesis for amino acid interactions. And so, what, what I began to wonder when we first saw this is, I mean, is this, uh, it's not just like a little bit of the information in the, uh, the, to make a protein. Maybe the question is, is this all the rules that nature knows about how to make that protein? And of course, that seems absurd to state as, uh, uh, because after all, all we're doing is pulling out pairwise uh, correlations between positions. That seems hardly uh, reason to believe that you have all the rules. Uh, and for other technical reasons, it's not at all obvious that this thing is really a complete set of constraints for building a, a, a protein. But we wanted to test that. And how, you know, how do you test that, right? The idea is that if you want to test whether this is a full mapping of the instructions to make a protein, well, then what you should do is to go write yourself a computer program that doesn't know anything about that protein, doesn't know anything about its structure, doesn't know anything about anything. 
except it just knows these numbers. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, what evolution teaches us about the amino acids and their interactions. And then you should let this com computer program evolve in silico artificial sequences that nature never made, but that simply reproduces pattern. And then you should go to the lab and build those things and ask if they are really proteins. It's at least a, a formal test of whether this is a sufficient body of information to represent a protein. And this is exactly what was done. So here's an example of one of these design experiments. You start with random uh, uh, amino acid sequences, and you can see that it's random because the, the correlation matrix is just got spurious correlations due to the fact that you have a finite sampling of sequences. But then as you run the simulation, you basically evolve in the computer now sequences down here that start reproducing the same pattern that you got from the natural sequences. And the question is, if I went to lab and I built these sequences down here, are they really proteins? And the answer is, was quite remarkable. It really is yes. So here, for example, for the, the same protein I've been showing you all along, on the left is an example of what nature made. That's a rat brain uh, uh, protein, uh, a member of this family called PDZ. On the right is a completely artificial sequence that uh, is quite different from the natural sequences. In fact, the average identity of the sequence is shown here. But here's an experimental structure of that synthetic protein. In fact, it reproduces the structure of this protein. As far as we can tell yet, it produces the same structure to an accuracy that's the same as all the natural ones compared to each other. So it really is a, a sufficient set of rules to build the structure of the protein. But what was really interesting, it's not just about building the structure, it turns out that these proteins work and they work the same as the natural proteins too. So this artificial protein uh, turns out binds to one uh, substrate molecule in the mouse genome, which is shown to you in red here, uh, and it binds that that substrate within the same range as all the mouse proteins that can bind that substrate. So this is just a kind of a data set called a binding curve, but it shows you how the synthetic sequence in red is in the same range of, of all the natural ones when they bind this thing. So it appears that these, these simple models you get from evolution is not just like tip of the iceberg information about the protein, they really contain the rules to build its structure and its function. And in fact, we've, we've extended this work nowadays to uh, not only make these synthetic proteins in, in, the, in, the, in test tubes but, uh, and measure them in vitro, but it turns out you can put them back in the yeast, you can put them back in the E. coli, and the synthetic proteins are doing the functions uh, and, and recapitulating the function to the same extent that the natural proteins do as well. So this is really the statement that uh, these synthetic proteins are really like synthetic uh, versions of what nature might have made uh, because we've distilled the essential rules in the, um, uh, in the evolution for building these molecules. So what I, I guess what I'm summarizing everything here by saying is that, at least in the protein world, is that um, here's what has happened. We wanted to understand how a complex machine like a protein works. It's got a lot of amino acids and they all talk to each other and we don't know how to do experiments to learn everything, but if you can, make these, uh, uh, these genome-based models, it turns out that what we're doing essentially is, is compressing the information in these sequences into these low-dimensional simple models, capturing only pairwise interactions and so on. But then these models are apparently are able to be generative. That is that you can use them to design artificial sequences and, you go to, and when you study these artificial sequences, they reproduce the thing that you started with, okay? So these, it's a test that these sequence-based, genome sequence-based models uh, seem to be capturing inside of them uh, the basic design rules for proteins. And what's I think it really highlights the uh, significance of the compression here, that is uh, holding all this information in a simple model, what really brings that home are the numbers. You know, uh, so let me, uh, let me show you this. So you train these models, right? starting from like a thousand or five thousand examples that's typically what nature gives us in our in our public databases you can go and get yourself sequences from nature they're on the order of thousands of examples you can get these days from genome databases so you make these models from a thousand or five thousand examples and then you build a space of artificial design and the number of sequences that are statistically consistent with that model is like one with 25 zeros on it, right? So 
you know, what this, this number really is a statement that the models have simplified the representation. It, the, the, apparently the rules are so simple that there's a giant degenerate space of solutions that are statistically identical because we can sample from the space and the laboratory we find that those are folding functional proteins that work like the natural ones, okay? It also, not only is this a fundamental result because it tells you something about the complexity of the problem of proteins in evolution, but it also shows you that there's a huge space of functional proteins that we could now search to find interesting molecules that can solve real world problems. Uh, a design space, if you want, uh, inspired by evolution. And in fact, uh, uh, what I can say is, oops, going the wrong way, um, that, we, uh, that people are now really uh, thinking about uh, turning this into a kind of uh, engineering problem, you know, where you take proteins of interest, you, wanna, you want solutions for industrial enzymes, carbon capture, things of this nature that have eluded us for a long time. Maybe now by using these genome-derived computational models and coupling that with very fancy experimental methods to make all the, the synthetic uh, designs and test them all and even iterate around this process, the, the concept now is that we can really maybe uh, uh, design using this data-driven approach uh, molecules with specific uh, re required characteristics to solve real-world problems. And that's a, a thing that we, we and others now are calling data-driven molecular engineering. And I think it's a very exciting thing for the future to see if we can really use this concept of data-driven modeling to build uh, artificial proteins in the way that we've always hoped and imagined we could. Well, that's the uh, story of, uh, of proteins and, and how models for them could be learned. And, and, and we begin now to use these models to understand more deeply how proteins work and why they're built the way they are. But I want to go back to the problem I set up at the beginning. You know, the molecules are, are great because, I mean, we can really do a lot of, as you see, we can do lots of um, experiments with them. And, and, and design of proteins has both fundamental value as well as a lot of applied value, but what about all these scales? How are we gonna address um, models uh, for how biology works at, uh, you know, how do cells work? How do tissues like the brain work? You know, whole organisms and ultimately, you know, the uh, ecosystems, you know, we, we, we think about ecosystems in many ways. I mean, microbial, many people have heard here probably about things called microbiomes. Uh, how important communities of bacteria are in doing uh, complex reactions. And we want to understand all that. We'd like to have models for things across all these scales. Uh, and then in principle, if we can only develop the right infrastructure, we would like to demonstrate that by analysis and design, just in the same way that we have done in the past for protein molecules. So, you know, um, how can we do that? And, and what is a, what is a, a practical approach. And let me just tell you what kind of problems we would in principle like to solve, you know, um, about ecosystems, right? I mean, we, I think fundamental importance these days to understand how ecosystems sustain themselves. And, and, and then when things go wrong or the environments change, how do uh, ecosystems collapse? Right now, you, you all may have heard that the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, for example, is undergoing a massive kind of collapse. Uh, why and, and what are the constraints on that problem? In what way uh, can we predict what, how ecosystems uh, sustain themselves and collapse and can we do something about that? But to do that kind of problem, you know, you really need to understand the, the, what are right now uh, complex uh, interactions between all the species that sustain an ecosystem. And we don't have models for that really. Uh, we don't understand how species cooperate. And again, I want you to think about uh, the, the similarity of this kind of problem in some conceptual way with, what, with proteins. I mean, in proteins, the amino acids are the things that are cooperating together to create the structure and the function. Here we have species in an ecosystem. Everything is different from the point of view of physics and, um, and, and the underlying mechanisms. But conceptually, it's about trying to understand the, the pattern of, of cooperative interactions that makes this possible. And we don't have models for that yet. What about you know, uh, moving to things like tissues, you know, how, how, the, how does the brain work? It sounds like a very, you know, uh, problem everybody has asked somehow or another. And we don't have even the basic principles of stuff like how memories are encoded and learning happens in the brain. But it's, what we know is that it's probably very different the way that man-made computers work, right? But, uh, but 
um, we would like to have models for this. And I mean, the behaviors of the brain are spectacular. Uh, I'll play you a little video here of a, a chimpanzee uh, doing a thing called a working memory test. Uh, in this thing, what you're going to see is the monkey is going to get, uh, the, sorry, not monkey, the chimpanzee is going to get flashed on the screen uh, a set of numbers that get covered up very, very rapidly as soon as they're shown. And what the, uh, what the chimp has to do is to touch the numbers in the order. And if, uh, uh, that, if it's correct, then it gets rewarded. So let's just watch this chimpanzee in operation here. I mean, the whole thing to me is really amazing because uh, it's really like a, a like a kind of photographic memory, right? It's something that, by the way, uh, the same test when humans do it, they are vastly uh, underperforming compared to the chimpanzees in here. It just tells you the capacity of the brain to do uh, things is really quite extraordinary. These are things that we don't understand how that neural network does these sort of things, but these are things to understand. And, and probably, again, I, I suspect it'll be very different than how uh, man-made computers work. Uh, at the level of uh, whole organisms, here is a fly. And the flies are, do a certain kind of behavior called escape jump response. When predators have shadows over their visual space, uh, flies are really good at doing this behavior uh, in which they jump backwards and take off flying. This is an evolutionary conserved behavior which is a computation being done by the brain of the fly and is sending the information to the flight muscles and the jump muscles to do this. Again, we would like to have models for how this kind of behavior works and how it can be so uh, robust and reliable and evolutionarily conserved, and we don't have that as of yet. Even down at the level of cells, this is a famous movie collected by David Rogers in the late 1950s on the action of an immune cell. This is a human neutrophil uh, and uh, it's in a blood smear, uh, and, and you're, you're going to see a movie, and what it shows you is how this neutrophil is tracking and chasing down this one bacterium, and that bacterium is, you see that little uh, black spot there. So it's ignoring all the other cells, it's ignoring the other bacteria, it's really going after this one bacterium, and finally catches this bacterium and eats it, right? This is what a, 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 a immune cell is supposed to do. Uh, but how is that you know, this is a, a, a remarkably complex behavior. This cell has to reorganize its internal shape to move, and it's, re it's dynamically organizing its cytoskeleton so that it's able to track this object uh, and, and ultimately catch up to it. This kind of a question, how does that uh, behavior work? We, we, we are still trying to understand that. You know, and we can ask the question why we can't explain all these behaviors as of yet. Um, you know, it's not because people have, haven't tried very hard or people have been, you know, not intelligent about this or something. If we just look at the machinery, forget about the, the neutrophil, forget about the, the, um, uh, the fly or the chimpanzee or the ecosystem. If we just look at the machinery inside of one of these simplest life forms, the, ba the bacterium, you know, it looks like this, right? This is a, a diagram. And, and I know you can't see anything here, and that's sort of the point. You're not supposed to be able to see anything. This is the, the stuff that we've learned over the last 50 years of biology about the parts and reactions. This is a portion of core metabolism in a cell. And it just highlights the you know, apparent complexity of these systems. These are highly, these are systems made out of a lot of parts. They interact with each other in a dense network. A lot of times these interactions are nonlinear in nature and it creates a, a, a global a property that we really can't compute yet from knowing even all the parts and all the connections. And I would say that's sort of the, the central point I'm trying to make here that, that biological systems across all these scales, you know, if there's one thing you can say it's common about them is they look like dense networks of interactions. Um, we have, we've been very good actually, I think in biology at defining all these parts and connections. And that's been very, very important work and a lot of beautiful things have emerged from this. But as a result of that work, we, yet, we don't yet have models for the behavior of the whole. Uh, and, and, and I will take you back to what we talked about in proteins. It's the same story of, uh, in some sense of proteins. Proteins are made out of collections of atoms and they have a global properties. There are dynamics that make them have this machine-like character. And that is a, 
example of this kind of problem, but you can restate this problem with completely different uh, uh, um, uh, machinery and uh, physics at uh, all of these different scales. And I think it's an interesting thing to say that this is a uh, kind of a, a statement of a general problem we have to solve in biology. So um, they look like dense networks of interactions. And I have this but here because what I mean to say is, but we have an underlying guess, I would say, or a hypothesis that hiding out inside of these dense networks of interactions is some simpler representation that, that really uh, explains how it works and gives us the design rules. And that, I'm, I will admit, there's no formal proof to what I just said. It's a statement of uh, almost belief that that's a way that these things are built. And there's reasons to believe that because of limitations coming from the physics, uh, but also limitations coming from evolution and the, and the evolutionary dynamics that force these systems to be in some sense simpler than they could be given their dense network of interactions. So I'll just say that uh, as a last thought that um, I think a lot of us are hopeful that you know, uh, in much the way that so far people have done this at the scale of molecules, proteins and so on, that we're collecting data and biology as Michael said at the beginning in introducing this talk, he made the point that people have been collecting a lot out of data and biology, uh, and they're doing a really good job at it. So we have uh, sequences of molecules, but we have, you know, omics, uh, uh, proteomics, genomics, uh, imaging, uh, uh, very dense um, uh, data sets about images. Um, there, there's something called connectomics, where people are trying to really solve the pattern of synaptic connections between every, every neuron in the brain. Um, I know there's across the scale, there's uh, a lot of data being generated. And if you take this belief that there is a possibility to compress those data into some simpler representation that contains deep information about the underlying uh, physics of how these things work and also tells you something about their evolutionary origin, then maybe a good way to, uh, to go in biology now is to use a data-driven approach uh, where we use tools, much like uh, uh, people are doing with machine learning and other ways, uh, to make statistical models that, uh, you know, they don't tell you the, um, the, the mechanism uh, and don't tell you everything, but they can be good ways to identify the low dimensional, uh, what I would call effective variables of these complex biological systems, and then bring back intuition, which is much needed to develop proper experiments towards better models for how these things work. And I think at the level of protein molecules, this is you know, coming close to being achieved or is getting there. Uh, and, and we hope in the next several years that there will be some formal understanding of these kind of things at the level of proteins. And now the question is, can we use these kind of approaches or learn something from these approaches to address these uh, problems more broadly? Um, so that's an open question, and I don't know the answer to whether that's going to be possible, but uh, a lot of us hope so, and people are working towards that. So uh, let me uh, stop there, actually, and it's been, uh, you know, 45 minutes. I think it's uh, what, we, what we expected to do. Let's, let me pause there. I'd be happy to uh, uh, answer questions and discuss these things that were uh, presented today. Okay, thanks, Rama. That was really a fantastic talk. And oh, uh, Michael, I can't hear you, I think. Oh, can you hear me now? No, I don't think I'm. Oh, there can you hear me? Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I can hear you now. Was my... That was a fantastic talk, and it um you know from proteins to beyond in biology, and it was a wonderful. <laughs> talk of what we we would be discussing now if we were all in Aspen together? So that was great. And I guess now the question <laughs> is, if um if anyone has questions, you know, please raise your hand, and I will call on you. Um, and if I can figure out how, oh, I, I can all figure this out, and also um. You can also put comments in the chat and I can call on you that way. Um, Adam, you're first. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful talk and very clearly explained. Uh, my question is about the uh, effective variables that you talked about at the end. Yes. I guess um, kind of reminds me, like we are determining the, the, the proper basis vectors that make it easiest to understand the system at hand, like a PCA um, for in, 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 in machine learning. Question is, is it useful or possible to do a hybrid approach where not in the beginning you aren't doing thousands or millions or billions of random uh, mutations, you are instead doing targeted experimental mutations along these new basis vectors that we found through data analysis? Uh, precisely. Uh, what you said is exactly correct. Uh, the, the idea is to use this kind of uh, 
if, uh, if the effective variables, the, the, vari the, the variables in which we think the problem live, the idea being that these data sets are very high dimensional, but the whole idea is there's some low dimensional manifold and there's some space in which the problem really lives. And if we can identify that by doing, uh, uh, finding the right basis set, then we can do, uh, this is what I mean here when I say much needed return to some intuition, that we can do experiments uh, that are not targeting that in a way, and then we wouldn't have to do the random experiment, which is impossible. Instead, we would do target experiments where we could really probe uh, the, the problem in, in a much more uh, uh, intelligent way. And I think that's exactly what, I mean, I, I think at the level of proteins, this is what has been happening for the last uh, you know, 15 years. And I think that that's the right approach to, that's the only way actually I can think of how to deal with this problem across all these scales. So I think what you said is, exactly the, the protocol that we're hoping. Thank you. Again, wonderful talk. Thank you. Sure. More questions. People have to ask questions. Zoom only works if people ask questions. You're not allowed to be shy. Yeah, if you don't, Michael's going to ask me questions and they're going to be hard questions, okay? So. Oh, where there be silly <laughs> You can't ask a more silly question than me. Okay, I'll ask a question while everyone is... Um, uh -oh. But somebody else has to ask a question next because this isn't fair. So, I mean, Rama, I guess, you know, this idea that, you know, there's like on the slide that you have up, this idea that, you know, interactions between amino acids and proteins are somehow like, you know, interactions of cells and tissues is very yeah. appealing. And I mean, the, as you said, it's sort of easier experimentally to probe with proteins because you can, of course, change the amino acids. And I guess what I'm, I, what I'm sort of wondering is, is there any way of pushing this beyond just being a qualitative analogy? I mean, it's sort of easy to say people are like cells and cells are like amino acids, but it just sort of, that doesn't mean it's true or that there's anything substantive in it. I mean, is there any yeah. hope in our lifetime of like sorting this out in a, in a, in a serious quantitative matter like, like you know, you're, you've been able to and people are starting to do with proteins? Yeah, so um, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, you know, more messy in the middle, but actually I'll give you an example from the other end of the spectrum from the ecosystem scale, right? So the, some of our colleagues um, uh, are, are collecting data on like microbial communities, okay? Where it's possible to uh, make uh, measurements of um, like, uh, let me give you a specific example. Um, there's this process that um, uh, Sepa Cohen and Madhav Mani are working on, which involves a process that happens by communities of bacteria in freshwater lakes called denitrification and that whole reaction happens not because of the action of one bacterium but a community of bacteria that come together and carry out that reaction and it turns out that you can make measurements just like we did with uh, in some sense with proteins where you can um, start mixing bacteria in pairwise combinations and so on and so forth and ask uh, how many numbers do I have to know about interactions between the bacterial species to be able to predict the behavior of the whole in terms of this uh, 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 of these processes like denitrification, and what's amazing is it turns out that also there, really low dimensional models capturing even just pairwise correlations between the species seem to suffice to design synthetic communities that can work like the, the their natural counterparts, and it gives us some sense, hope. You know, like you said, the variables are completely different, the the physics are completely different, but. Uh, that, that it's a similar concept that one can write down quantitative models that, that have just pairwise interactions and so on and make predictive models for communities. And that, I don't know if that's going to be a general result and it holds for all kinds of things, including like gut microbiomes and all that. But certainly that's, an, that's a thing in which I think you can do real experiments and, and, and really bring this to sharp clarity, not just an analogy, as you say. And maybe I'll just want to make one other comment. Maybe this is also true in the scale of cells where people can collect uh, these days a lot of data about signaling networks, responses of cells to many ligands and even in pairwise combinations and can we again make models from those things that make predictive models for the response of cells to arbitrary inputs. Uh, I think those are really possible things to do. Cool, good, okay, nice. Okay, so we have another, actually we have two more questions. I'm Sasha Grossberg, why don't you go first? Uh you were a little bit quick when you described this computational evolution of protein sequencing. But we know from macroscopic evolution that 
a bacteria can evolve resistivity to this drug if it is exposed to this drug or to that drug if it is exposed to that drug. Yes. Surely in computational, I would imagine that in this computational design of protein sequences, you can subject it to different types of pressures. You can ask the sequence, for instance, to fold quickly yes. or to catalyze something or to do something else. Yes. And as a result, you may obtain different, different uh, uh, connectivity matrices. Yes. So what would you do? How do you choose? Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, so that in a way, what is beautiful about these uh, the evolutionary database models is that they represent what has happened. The problem with these models is they represent what has happened. And you don't know what has happened. And, and, and you're right, the, the, the fitness function that's happening is some uh, potentially complicated multidimensional optimization over lots of things, uh, not just about function, but even about the history of the selection process. So the only, uh, so, um, you know, in fact, we've been able to show um, uh, that uh, these models sometimes can be factorized so that you can see subsets of amino acids that mediate different uh, biochemical properties of the protein, like, for example, substrate specificity uh, uh, versus catalytic power versus uh, thermo thermodynamic stability, uh, that that's sometimes you get that kind of ability to factorize the problem into these different uh, subsets. Uh, but in general, I completely agree with you. The, the, the models really represent a, a complex fitness function. I think one way to proceed uh, is to start doing some laboratory evolution where we don't strictly rely only on the past history of evolution, but to actually do forward evolution in the laboratory where we can control everything like the way we present the problem to the protein and ask how the design that comes out is now a function of the selective pressure and its characteristics that we impose on the evolution. So the only way I can think of doing this is really to do proper forward evolution experiments where you know everything about the presentation of the problem uh, to the protein. And, and actually we and others are in fact doing those kind of experiments now. So hopefully by that we'll understand something about how, what exactly you said, which I think is the most interesting problem. How does the, the how does the um, pattern of constraints depend on the statistics of environments and the nature of the selection process during evolution. I think that's the probably the most interesting future uh, result that I'm hoping to that we all find. Good. So Jay, do you want to ask the next question? Yes, thank you. Um, would you go back to those blue graphs? I think you may have called it a matrix once and tell us what is the x-axis, what is the y-axis? And yeah. what is the color encoding? It was mostly blue, and then there was like a lot of red dots on the yeah. diagonal. So, yeah. And is so, this a standard for exchanging information in your field? I, yes. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. It's standard. Uh, it's it's a representation of a, of a of a weighted covariance matrix. So what this thing shows you is how uh, uh, how every position in this protein, uh, the rows here represent the linear sequence of the protein from the beginning to the end, the polypeptide sequence. So it's position one, two, three, four, like that. Um, the cartoon that's above the matrix shows you the secondary structure pattern of the protein going from beginning to end. And this is a, uh, a symmetric covariance metric. So it shows you how every position of the protein is correlated in evolution with every other position of the protein. The, uh, the color scheme is uh, shown at the bottom, goes from blue to red, where blue would mean those pair of positions are not correlated with a, significantly with each other in the course of the evolution. And the uh, more the colors tend towards red, the stronger is the correlation of those two positions. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's ways to measure the noise uh, in these uh, matrices, and you can then say something about the degree to which there are signals here that are beyond the uh, the ex random expectation. And based on that, one then carries out the analysis I showed in the next slide, which is to under sort of make statements about what the pattern contains. Does that help? A bit, thank you. Okay. 
cool. So Rama, there's been another question in the chat. Are you there, Rama? Yes, I'm here. Right, so somebody wrote and asked whether or not the right conceptual model for a protein is that the, um, the, the, the core circuitry is, um, is in the middle that helps it fold and that all of the functional stuff is on the outside. So I'm paraphrasing, but that was the question. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, it, it's an interesting, uh, well, let's go forward. Like, well, not this, sorry, uh, the, this thing. Okay, so um, what is the role uh, or what properties of proteins emerge from the blue network and what comes from the surroundings? Good, okay, so uh, experiments are, have been done on this and, and are ongoing. What we understand now is the following. The foldability of proteins, the ability of a random, if you take a, first of all, let me back up and make one statement. If you take a random amino acid sequence and try to put it in a physiological buffer and see what happens, in general, nothing happens. It doesn't fold at all. Uh, it gets stuck in some uh, uh, high entropy state. So the foldability of proteins, the ability for them to reach what is called the native state ensemble, the, 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 uh, the structure, is a property of the blue network. Uh, the function of the protein is a property of the blue network as far as we can tell so far, like the characteristics like binding, specificity, and affinity seem to be sufficiently represented by imposing the, that, that network. Um, even the evolvability of proteins, the ability to have mutations that enable paths of uh, mutational variation towards new functions, what's called evolvability, is, seems to also originate from mutations within the blue network. The surroundings around it are, bring a very critical property. They bring thermodynamic stability to the native state. And without that thermodynamic stability, you don't have the action of this collective network. So it's like stability uh, and uh, is in the contact architecture around uh, that, that's surrounding these things. And the basic uh, foldability function and evolvability, so far the model uh, we have is that it emerges from these more collective uh, networks. Um, and that is uh, a, uh, has been tested in a, in a few systems. I think it deserves a lot more deep testing um, and it does, those studies are ongoing. Okay, great. Very good. So it's now um, 6.30. We're supposed to end after an hour. So I guess I would like to propose that we all clap. If you haven't clapped with Zoom, then you really should because you know um, we have to be somehow and so you should all find there's a little reaction button in the lower right hand corner and here I'm going to clap so everyone should clap for Rama um, that was really a great talk Rama thank you and um, thank you for um, for going through you know just thank you that was a, a, just a fabulous summary of the subject and um, hopefully next year we can all do this um, and continue these discussions in Aspen um, I am um, um, for everyone else um, these public lectures are ongoing um, on Thursdays at 5.30, and I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I'm sure there will be an equally spectacular lecture next week. And um, although, no, Rama, nothing can be as spectacular as your talk about proteins, but um, some other area of physics, and I welcome you all to come back, and we can do this again. So that's it. Thanks, everybody.